Scuba Obsessed Weekly Podcast, we talk about all things scuba diving, from cool new gear to places a dive and scuba the news. Scuba Obsessed episode 400 is recorded live March 21st, 2019. Welcome back to Scoob Obsessed. I'm Darren Jolson coming to you from the southwest side of the great state of Michigan, which where it's great to not be under the weather. Joining me this week, we have Mac, the dive mentor. How are you doing today, Mac? So far, so good. No use of a cane and no walker, so I'm looking. Well, that's always good. Yes, it is. When, when you mentioned you wanted to get back in the water, did the doctor wince or is he? Uh, well, he says, after I finish some more physical therapy, or I shouldn't say more, as I restart physical therapy, but my pound limit is now up to 25 pounds instead of 10, which means I can do housework. I can do the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the wife says, that's a good one. Yeah, that's, that's uh, I'm, okay. But isn't, I would say scuba diving is physical therapy. It is. Um, as long as I don't carry my tanks, and that's why I like to go to Paw Paw. We can either use the dolly car or, like Larry last time, put them in the cart, brought them out uh-huh. to the pier. That way I dress in the water. I just back up to the dock, put it in, go right into the water. There's no weight on me. Yeah, how about how about a hooker rig? Oh, that's even better. Yeah? Yep, that works great. You know, Marie yeah. got into the water. No, I didn't know that. Yep, that's, how, how, she's, uh, wow, she that's got awesome. into water the other day with her husband. They were out at one of the... Um, um, Indian grounds that has a lake, and they got in the water. She wasn't in long, but that's her first dive since last September. Wow. Uh, and she seemed to be recovered very well from the uh, accident. Oh, that's great. And she, so wore, she used the tank that was uh, signed by all of us at the ecology dive last September. Awesome. Yeah, that's got to feel good to get back in the water. Kind of lets you feel like you're you're getting somewhere normal. Well, I mean, just me, I, I hadn't dove all summer because of my back, but I couldn't miss the New Year's dive. So mm-hmm. I got in two weeks before to make sure all my crap worked, and then we're ready for the night dive. Because I really wouldn't be smart to do that first no. dive no. in nine months with my back bad that night, you know. Well, unless you really wanted to be in the, no, in the news. Yeah, but then I wouldn't have been able to read about it. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Well, I'd like to thank everybody who's in the chat room for this 400th episode. We have Derek and Eric, the old diehards who have uh, shown up and are in there. They ought to get some kind of prize or something for bearing with us this many years and many podcasts. I I wish I was more organized and kept track of who was in the chat room for each episode. You know, do like a little counter. Yeah, what they are, they're they're all the time. Yeah, they've... Certainly, in at least the last hundred, they have been there more often than the not. And that is they're appreciated, and we also appreciate everybody who listens online or however you listen. So we would have never made it to episode four hundred any other way. And and maybe as we get towards the end, I'll pull up some numbers so just to kind of share where the the podcast has come from and uh, where it is today. I so. really would love to hear from a lot of those people, though. To see if they're one still listening, and what do they want us to change, if anything? Yeah, yep. And if you do have some feedback for the show, you can do it at the show at scubaobsessed dot com, or you head to the website www dot scubaobsessed dot com, and uh, the contact us page will give us links in a form of how you get there. And if you don't hear anything back in the week, it means we missed it. We're also on Facebook, facebook dot com forward slash scubaobsessed, or on Twitter at scubaobsessed. And uh, while you're at it, if you've been enjoying the show any time during these first 400 episodes, if you can give us a little bit of support, especially in in contribution to this 400th episode, we'd certainly appreciate it. Go to our website, www.scubaobsessed.com, and click on over the Patreon link and uh, leave us a little bit. And if you can't do that, we understand uh, five-star reviews on whichever way you listen to the podcast would certainly be appreciated that helps get more people listening 
So and this, actually, any review would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we we prefer the five of the the. Oh well, yeah, one, but if we don't deserve it, stars don't. Yeah, no. Certainly, I hopefully we've we we earned some sort of rating there. Well, I'm sure we got some rating. <laughs> we got some. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> So this first article is police arrest two for stealing $25,000 in scuba gear and valuables. A pair of thieves broke into some storage units at storage by the sea early last month in Lanier Plaza, according to a, uh, absconding, I said according, absconding with approximately 25,000 scuba diving equipment, and other valuables. This is according to Brunswick police report. The loot was a little profit until the culprits could find a place to dump in exchange for cash. That's how the Brunswick police detectives cut up with uh, Matthew Martin Stembridge and Tom Lee Jones, who allegedly stole the gear. Uh, they were trying to get it through a pawn shop in Gold Golden Isles, according to the Brunswick Police Dependent dep- de- Dependent Department uh, Officer Lieutenant Jose Galdemez the department's criminal investigation commander, the process the police have managed to return a significant portion of stolen goods to the victim. They had to come up with, come up in there with a pickup truck and trailer and just loaded it up. Uh, our investigation led us to these two guys, and we were able to find a lot of the property that had been pawned. Stembridge and Jones, both 29, remained Wednesday in the Glen County Detention Center, charged with two counts each, second-degree burglary. Addition, additionally, Stembridge of Darian is charged with several counts of theft by taking and seven counts of theft by deception. Jones of Brunswick is additionally charged with five counts of theft by taking and five counts of theft by deception. According to jail records, the victim discovered the break in on February 2nd and reported to police. The thieves had removed the locks and several storage units at storage by the sea. Um, in addition to a large amount of diving gear, the victim was also missing other valuables, including generator, expensive bicycles and coolers. So good to see that they got it back. Where is this at? I was looking at it. Brunswick, St. Simons, Jekyll Sea Island, Camden County. Where is that? Uh, for some reason, I'm thinking that's New Jersey. Doesn't that sound like a New Jersey direction? I was thinking more like New Zealand, but then again. Brunswick News Publishing is where this was reported. Let's see if I can get a – oh, wait. Uh, Brunswick, Georgia, actually. So like we're both Georgia, wrong. Georgia, Brunswick, GA. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Not, not Georgia's in, uh, uh, South of Russia. Yeah. Down below yeah. Carolina. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I looked at the picture and it looks like that. So a reasonable place to have scuba gear. Yeah. I wonder if I've not seen any feedback or any other postings on those robberies we covered last week where they came in and got all the stuff out of the two shops. Yeah, I looked, I hadn't seen anything. So, well, if uh, anybody sure. else sees it, make sure they yep. drop us a line so we can yeah, do some follow up. Yeah. Hopefully they, they find them. Usually it seems like it takes about two or three weeks for the people to be tracked down. Depends on how they fenced it. Uh, Cause you know, dive shops are going to be talking to each other. And if somebody comes in with a whole bunch of it, uh, the other thing is, is will be, uh, you know, that much dive gear, you either got to go and unload it real quick or you, you know, do the Craigslist or eBay or something, then eventually somebody will catch up to you. So here we have an article where 50,000 pound whale tucks a scuba diver under its fin. A marine biologist and her team are delighted to encounter a 50,000 pound or 22,680-kilogram whale on one of their snorkeling adventures. But the light soon turned to great fright as the giant whale started pushing against her with its head. Whilst things looked like they could have turned ugly, it turned out the massive whale had another purpose, and no one got hurt at the end of the day. It was on October 2017th, the whale biologist Nan Hauser, 63, was snorkeling in the South Pacific when a giant whale approached her. The heavyweight humpback whale got so close that she was able to capture some incredible footage. However, the massive mammal started getting a little physical, and when you're up against something that's heavier than two school buses, you know it's not playtime. Hauser's life was at stake. I stayed calm to a point, but was sure that 
it was most likely going to be a deadly encounter. Her anxiety, t- her anxious team on a nearby research boat were worried for her safety. They stopped their drone footage because they did not want to film my death, said the biologist. I tried to get away from him for fear that if he rammed me too hard or hit me in the flipper or tail, it would break my bones, rupture my organs. If he held me under his pectoral fin, I, I would have drowned. I didn't want to panic because I knew I, he would pick me up on, on my fear. I felt very close kinship with the animal, so despite my trepidation, I tried to stay calm and figure out how to get away from him. However, she tried. The giant wouldn't stop pushing her, nor would let her go. I spent 28 years underwater with whales, have never had a whale so tactical, tactile, and so insistent on putting me on its head or belly and back, and most of all, trying to tuck me under its huge pectoral fin, said Hauser, who was in the waters off Maury Beach, uh, was it Rarotunga, the Cook Islands. The whale pushed her around for over 10 minutes, which felt like hours to Hauser. She then thought she spotted another whale in the distance. It turned out to be a shark. A 15-foot-long tiger shark was lurking nearby. Hauser finally realized a giant mammal had been protecting her from being attacked by the shark. She said it was another whale slapping the water with its tail, trying to divert the shark away. When Hauser returned to the boat, she could see footage that the whale even glanced above the water, perhaps to make sure she was safe. Humpback whales have been reported for their altruistic behavior towards other people, said Hauser, but this is the first documented case of humpback whale protecting a human from a fairly large shark. I like the aspect that she talked about, and we, we mentioned that last week, about uh, practices of a good diver is not to touch animals. And she, mm-hmm. she quoted here, says, I never touched the animals, but I studied for 10 minutes. The whale had other ideas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, right off the bat, you know, I don't touch them. I don't touch them just to get good photos. And that was right. one of the topics we talked about last week. That would get that, your attention, but do you see the visibility there? Awesome. That, that is Unbelievable. And uh, I, I'm not being crass, but I think most of the guys I know would have kept the drone flying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. One way or the other, there's a, a clip there. But the thing is, it went on as long. She said the drone might not have had battery, so they may have just told her, "Ah, oh, we didn't want to capture it." But yeah, it was taking too much time. <laughs> yeah. Come on. <laughs> we're, you're, we're, getting, we're losing the shot. I would well, have I'm made real good she, she, coverage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're glad she uh, is doing okay and that that turned out well. Uh, and, and you hope that's what was going on. Yes. And then uh, over in the Sandusky, Ohio area of the White Star Park, upgrades are almost complete. Uh, work is nearly completed on more than 2 million improvements at White Star Park. As the calendar edges closer to spring and the opening of the park's campgrounds and beach areas, Sandusky County Park Director Andrew Brown said the project is about 95% complete, with contractors finishing up on epoxy work on the scuba area's restrooms and toilets still needing to be installed and the park's benches in scuba areas. We're like right there, Brown said Thursday. The park district plans to complete a $775,000 water sewer extension project at White Star in conjunction with the County Sanitary Engineering Commissioner's Office that brings water from Gibsonburg and sends sewer discharge back to the village for treatment. A second $1.3 million project will bring four new buildings to White Star Park and new restrooms at the campground, scuba barn, and beach areas with an ADA accessible shower at the campground and a concession area on the beach. The new White Star campground facilities will feature four shower stalls, men's and women's restrooms, in addition to ADA Accessible shower, new scuba area buildings will include six restrooms. Spear Brothers Incorporated is a contractor for the water sewer extension project. Roma Design Construction LLC out of Cleveland's contractor for the building's portion. For the new buildings, about half of the $1.3 million will be funded through the Park District's Wetland Migration Fund and half from the General Fund, Brown said. The project is being financed through a 20-year Ohio Water Development Authority loan. Brown said Thursday the project's a little under budget. He said there's still some final items that need to be completed, including some painting and laying down grass seed. The project's final step will involve turning on the water to beach and scuba areas. Brown said the park district's contract with contractors require all work to be done by May 1st. 
White Star Campground facilities are scheduled to open April 15th in the park's beach opening Memorial Day, Brown said. He said he expects the parks to hold a ceremony at some time to celebrate the completion of the projects and the new improvements. So uh, our friend Rich Sinewick, who um, I'm assuming he's still managing the concession he was last I knew, and after this was announced, so I'm sure he's still in there. Uh, I'm sure he's got to be excited that this is almost done. Yeah, two million dollars to an area that you're working. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'd be very curious about the economics of that. You know, this is this is like a park project. So, yeah, you know, if you look at it on the short term, but how many years are they doing this one? Twenty. Uh, yeah, it looks that way. Twenty years. Yeah, and really, if you're going to try and develop and promote this. Uh, the the better bathrooms that you have the i'm i'm sure there should be a direct correlation with uh usage that's you true know. i mean i don't know how many people they actually have out there yeah cuz uh, like that, i'm sure go ahead yeah i was going to say like gall lake you know which is n- not quite the same type of uh facility but uh, i mean that's got bathrooms I'm sure that the use by diving community would be quite a bit less if there wasn't some sort of plumbing and water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just looking. They said uh, diving at White Star is considered to be the best inland diving that northern Ohio has to offer. And I think part of the reason they got the, the money aspect is it's for, for non-diving people also. Until I'm this one for mm-hmm. Oh, White yeah, Star. this is – well, the, the campground I know is, is fairly popular. And then you got the uh, diving, diving concession and then the regular park area. Yeah, because I said, uh, it's also a place where you can bring our non-diving friends and family with us without having to pay to have them sit and watch. You can bring friends and family and even your dog at no charge. So that makes sense because that's not just a avenue to make money as the priority of the dive facility. It's like yeah, the aspect. Oh. A lot of the diving concessions we know where they're, they're either quarries or other uh, contained lakes uh, tends to be charged for everybody. To get in, you pay. Right. So even if you're just a bubble watching you know, and you're reading a book, you're still paying the same fee everybody else is. And it's always nice when you got a bathroom and even nicer, not even, but nice too, when you got warm showers at the end of the dive. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. And I haven't heard of this activity before, but uh, Michael Israel, is, uh, I guess, is going to attempt it in Tampa Bay, an underwater speed paint for the first time. Michael Israel, a world-renowned artist famous for speed painting, comes to St. Petersburg to attempt his craft underwater for the first time ever. Speed painting is artistic technique where the painter has a limited time to finish the work and puts a show on while doing it. The artist will dive in the Admiral Farragut's Academy pool with scuba students and the WFLA News Channel's L- L- Lila Gross to create a masterpiece underwater. Israel is working with Admiral Frigate Academy to raise awareness for upcoming Reach for the Stars fundraiser Saturday, April 8th, 2019, from 6.30 to 10.30 p.m. And if you click in the show notes, you can find out some more information about it. But uh, Well, that is a pre-K to 12th grade private college prep. Boarding and Day School, located in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I, I talked about it's a world-renowned boarding military program that begins in the eighth grade. Mm-hmm. So he's, I, I've not, so speed painting is, it, that must be something similar to, uh, I can remember when I was a kid, you would see on TV people who would do characters. And it would be kind of like a comedy routine. And they they usually would do it like with a line drawing and he'd, he had some routine or skit he would do and the way that he did the painting, you couldn't see what it was until he did like the last two lines or something. So well, I bet I he does it. I was going to say, I bet he doesn't use water soluble paint. Yeah. <laughs> I did click on that link. There's a nice <coughs> picture of one of the Academy's location and proximity mm-hmm. to the ocean and to the Bay area. It's quite attractive. Yeah. Uh. See, I, I could I could do speed painting. I I could do one where I just paint all in red and call it Shark Attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I I could do that. Uh, and then we have an article from History dot com. Uh, 
And this, this one I thought was interesting. A 5th century BC, oh, in the 5th uh, century BC, Greek historian wrote about distinctive barge he saw in, in Egypt. Archaeologists have finally found it around 450 BC. Greek writer, oh, let me see, Greek name. These have got to be easy. Uh, Herodus? Pretty close. Uh, yeah, okay. Traveled to Egypt. His later account of the trip included the famous shipwreck, The Histories, focused on a, a distinctive river barge known as Barris, which he said the Egyptians used to ferry goods up and down the Niles River. Uh, Herodotus uh, described the vessels having a single rudder that passed through a hole in the keel and a massive acacia wood papyrus sails. For centuries, scholars have been unable to find evidence that such a vessel existed until now. A team of researchers investigating the sunken ruins of the ancient port city uh, Thonis, Hersalon, Located off the coast of Alexandria, Egypt, had discovered more than 70 shipwrecks. One of those wrecks, archaeologists say, is a well-preserved vessel that almost exactly matches Herodotus's uh, description of the barge. Called Ship 17, it originally measured up to 28 meters long with a crescent-shaped hull, 70%, which has survived, <coughs> and thick planks of acacia wood held together with long wooden ribs or tendons. Or tendons. Uh, Herodotus described the boat as having long internal ribs. Nobody really knows what it meant. Damian Robinson, director of the Oxford Center of Marine Archaeology, told The Guardian that structure has never been seen archaeologically before. And we discovered this form of construction on this particular boat, and it's absolutely what Herodotus had been saying before Alexandria, Alexandria was founded in 331 B.C. Uh, it was one of the world's greatest port cities, welcoming all ships coming to Egypt from the Greek world, built around a massive temple to the god Amun Garib. The city resembled Venice, Italy, which was intricate work of canals. Uh, the effort, effects of a series of natural disasters caused by the city's central island to liquefy near the end of the 2nd century AD, and by the end of the 8th century, the last remains of the city had collapsed into the Mediterranean. In 2000, team of the European Institute of for Underwater Archaeology, directed by French archaeologist Frank uh, Godio, discovered the ruins Aruba Q Bay, some six and a half kilometers off the coast of Alexandria. In addition to shipwrecks, the underwater excavation yielded gold coins, statues, and remains of the city's great temple. Uh, and they go on talk about some books. Uh, yeah. I like the part where they say, celebrated by many as a father of history, he also had his flair, his fair share of critics. Many of you accused him of writing more fiction than fact. Well, I mean, this should give him credibility to some other stuff because I, I think this is one where they had always said that, oh, no, there, there are no examples. Why did he just? Right about that. But. Right, because they're, they're saying here, some of the tallest tales, his distractors claim, involve the various things he said he saw, but nobody, you know, nobody's said anything about them or have seen them since. Like you said, now it validates some of the stuff he said. Yeah. Oh, did you read the part of it? One famous example, he claimed that in Persia he saw giant ants the size of foxes, which spread gold dust when they dug their mounds. After being dismissed for centuries, this story was vindicated in nineteen nineties when the French explorer or a French explorer discovered a fox sized merit in the Himalayas that did in fact spread gold dust while digging, and had done so since ancient times. The Persian words for mountain ant and marinot were quite similar, it turns out, leading people to conclude that it probably fall victim to a simple error in translation. Ah. Uh. And that's quite interesting because that could very well, you know, be true. Oh, yeah. What we yeah, consider there's... an ant, in my mind, was not big as a fox. Mm. Yeah, but, it, I mean, it, at first glance, especially if you were going back trying to validate the story, it just sounded almost like a, a fantasy tale. Yeah. Well, the nice part, if you, if you had clicked on that and went further down for other content, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to save this channel and start looking at some stuff here. One of it is uh, there's another sidebar 
when we talked about, oh, a couple of God, months ago about that slave ship that was on shore. And they yeah. were digging dig it. There's an article on that one in this thing, too. Wow. Uh, yeah. History.com, which this is the uh, website which goes along with the, uh, it looks like the History Channel. So they've just, uh, no, it's a, it looks like it's a nice site. Yeah. yeah. I like the part where they're showing the hand grenades used by pirates. <laughs> yeah, any any story about pirates and hand grenades has got to be pretty good. Well, I like the pictures because when we see junk down there, sometime, you know, if you haven't seen something similar to it, you may think that's what it is, is a rusty piece of junk, when in fact it's like, wait a minute, that's part of an old-fashioned hand grenade. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of it's in context and understanding what you're looking at. Yeah. And speaking of that, take a look at this uh, next one, which is the uh, Mariner's Astrolabe. Yeah. Uh, recovered from shipwreck as the world's oldest. It may not seem as exciting as a record for the longest fingernails or the largest collection of dinosaur poo, but a recently verification by Guinness World Records is a big deal for history buffs, as Jennifer Aulette of Ars Technica reported a disc found at one of Vasco de Gama's ship has been recognized the world oldest mariner's astrolabe. The astrolabe in question was one of 108 recovered by archaeologists, was located during the excavation of shipwreck, the Esmeralda, in 2014. As we previously reported, the Esmeralda isn't just any ship. When the wreck was initially found in 1998, it became the earliest vessel from the Europe- European age of exploration ever discovered. The vessel is part of an expedition to uh, subdue local merchants along India's Malabar coast, undertaken by Da Gama in 1502, several years after the Portuguese explorer successfully pioneered a trade route around the tip of Africa to India in 1497. When Da Gama turned for home in early 1503, he left behind several of his 20 warships under the command of his uncle's Vincent Sorde and Bras Sorde, their instructions were to hold the gains of the expedition they had made, but the uncles had other plans. They sailed instead to the Gulf of Aden, and a notorious series of attacks pillaged Arab merchant ships of valuable cargo. They continued to do so until April of that year when a massive storm grounded Bras' ship and the Seo Pedro and sunk the Esmeralda and the Vincent on board off all Himalaya Island in Amman. Uh, some 500 years later, when researchers came across a disc among the wrecks of the Esmeralda, any navigational markings had long worn off, making it unclear ex- what exactly they were looking at. So the wreckage team invited imaging experts from the University of Warwick to travel to Muscat, Amman in 2016 to laser scan the disc to determine if it was indeed an astrolab or merely a decorative object the 3d virtual model created from the scans 18 uniform scale marks are clearly discernible positively iding the artifact as an astrolab the disc researchers believe is likely owned by da gama's cousin vincent since the others bear portuguese royal coat of arms and a personal emblem of don manuel the first researchers from the university of warwick manufacturing group detailed the findings in a newly published paper And then along with that, they also certified that the bell recovered from the Esmeralda was the oldest known ship's bell. And those are unlikely to be the last finds. Uh, Mearns tells uh, Sarah Sloat at Inverse that his team will return to the ship during a project with Amund's Ministry of Heritage and Culture later this year. I like the part where it says the Astrolab is the original Uh smartphone, if you will, and has been uh, around a long time in different forms likely first appearing during the 2nd century A.D. No, no, how that saying, compared to that? <laughs> yeah, that's, I was trying to think of uh, what makes it a smartphone. It may, maybe if you're using smartphone for navigation, is that the idea? Cause well, the, 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 wasn't the technology for that really outstanding to have made the astronaut? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I think until you you kind of get to the point, you know, it's, it's – after it's done, then it kind of goes, oh, yeah, it was kind of obvious. But until that point, yeah, certainly wasn't. Yeah, I went, I went ahead and switched to that where they did an actual write-up on it. The abstract starts out saying, it is a uniquely leaded gunmetal disc decorated with iconic Portuguese markings 
which was recovered in 2014 during the archaeological excavations of the shipwrecks. Initially, mm-hmm. the identity and function of the disk was unknown, although it did possess the characteristics suggesting it could be an astrolab. Laser imaging of the disk, post-conservative conservation, uh, reveal regular scale marks on the limb, upper right quadrant, and went on to explain how they have then, then determined that it is, in fact, they said it was. Yeah. But to find that many of them. Yeah, that, it was like a, were they, were they, maybe it was going to be a trade good? Well, in 1957, they found 10 of them. In 1966, the number increased to 21. In 88, the number had registered to 65. So it's, and let's see here. And it's increased every, you know, as they continue their, their dig. Uh, current specimens stand at 109. And like you said, it looked like it was a trade good then. It's like, you know, so, selling, yeah. selling those smartphones wherever they went. Well, yeah. And maybe they there was like a speculation. Like, we know that's something that's unique to us. Uh, or, or maybe it was even barter. I mean, if you come across another captain, you could, you know. Uh, I mean, the other thing was, is it possibly? Yeah, but the fact they keep finding them, because I was thinking maybe it's, uh, it was a requirement for the crew. You know, everybody must have an astrolab. I don't uh, know. That's sort of an interesting question. Yeah, because were they like found all stacked up, you know, like they had been in a case or something, or are they just kind of sprinkled around? Yeah, that would have been the question too. Why do they, why did it take so long to get that? I was looking at a different picture of it, and they were talking about it's an elaborate inclom- inclom- duh, inclometer, historically used by astronomers and navigators to measure the altitude above the horizon of a celestial body day or night. We used to identify stars or planets to determine local latitude <laughs> given local time, to survey or triangulate. So if you're... Uh, a seagoing captain seems like you needed to have one of those. Oh, I would think so. I'd like to see the write up how they explain how to use it. But I'm sure it was one of those here it is, here, let me show you how to use it. Yeah. Well they did say that there were different markings on some versus others. Well, on some of this they were talking about some of the items, uh let's see. Degrees can be read, graduated edge of the astrolab, uh hints the work. The words, depending on who made it, could have been in Greek or otherwise. Therefore, the the emblems and the signatures around it could have been different. They had been made by different cultures. Right. And that would look totally different, one would think, anyway. Yeah. I wonder what there were. A different culture wouldn't put somebody else's coat of arms on it, either. True. Or their language. They'd use their own. Yes. So did, I am looking at a couple here that if they've been underwater, they sure did a good job of preservation. Uh, this one here was brass inlaid with silver in 1291. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. That looks like a very intricate calcul- mechanical calculator. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at some as well. And yeah, they're not, not all things are equal in the astrolab world. Yeah. I just wonder what they cost and what they're worth now, especially like the ones I'm looking at at the museum. Yeah. What's interesting is, is in the Wikipedia article, uh, they've got Greek, Arabic, and uh, Persian names for it, which are all very similar. Ah. So that's telling me that that would be about the area of, you know, one of those three cultures invented it. And since they're all next to each other, you know, you can't, that, that would have been like uh, your, the secret of the day, which it wouldn't have been a secret because once somebody had one had it, the others had to have it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you, you capture a, a, an enemy's vessel or borrow it and uh, you're going to, uh, Come across that and have to say, "Hey, this is a good idea." Uh, yeah, there's. They were saying it was invented uh, in the Hellenistic civilization by 
Panis of uh, Persia, per- Perga, between 22, uh, 220 and 150 BC, often attributed to Hippocaris. The astrolabe was a marriage of the planisphere in the dioptra, effectively an analog calculator capable of working out several different kinds of problems in astronomy. And then they've got some writings after the, uh, you know, into the common era where they detailed the uh, astrolab. So they continue to be used until uh, through the Byzantine period, about 550 AD. And then they said they were further developed in the medieval Islamic world where Muslim Astronomers introduced angular scales to design, adding circles indicating azimuths and horizon. It was li- uh, widely used throughout the Muslim world, chiefly to aid navigation as a way of finding uh, the direction to Mecca. And I'm, I'm looking at different designs. Those are some, those can be pretty. It always seems to be beauty in a new technology. Well, that does it for Scuba in the News this week. Are you still there? Or- yeah, I'm still here. It's, it's, it's amazing how quiet the lines are sometimes. Yeah. I was just looking to uh, the undercurrent again and a couple mm-hmm. of items that we had last week we didn't prove, but sure. uh, some little trivia items that they had to indicate plastic filled turtles. Uh, a new study by the University of Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK showed that 102 sea turtles examined three different oceans, each had ingested between 150 to up to 500 pieces of plastics, microplastics, and other synthetics. And, of course, they're all dead. Gives you an idea of what's out there and how it's really, really, really becoming a problem. And as a follow-up, we talked about the Red Sea where – one particular area was having a lot of people get bit by sharks. And it talked about if you booked a Red Sea liveaboard this month, you won't be going to the Brother Islands, one of the best sites in Egypt's Chamber of Diving and Water Sports. The governing board for scuba diving announced the islands will stay closed to divers until at least mid-March. That action was taken in response to some divers being bitten by sharks. And that article was in the January issue of Undercurrent talked about and adding a little bit of good news on coral bleaching they talked about as the population of corals across the world decreased thanks to climate change there's some good news coming from israel a recent study published by the journal of experimental biology reveals that spawns of the fully formed corals in the gulf of elet in the northern red sea inherited the same genetic imprint responsible for hot water adaptation making the Gulf one of the few places on Earth where the, or they said this, underwater ecosystem will continue for years to come in the face of deteriorating climate change or or weather. And the last one is, if you didn't look at it, and I watched it on TV, the question was, what's at the bottom of the Belize blue hole? And uh, British billionaire Richard Branson led a submarine expedition down there in December. And what he and his crew discovered at 400 feet, well, major item, plastic. Yep, besides the corpses of uh, crabs, clowns, other sea creatures that had fallen down and died, they saw a goodly number of plastic bottles. In his blog on uh, virgin.com, Branson wrote, the starkest reminder of the dangers of climate change I've ever seen, all got to get rid of single-use plastic. So those are a couple items I thought were quite interesting and follow-throughs on under. All good articles. Yeah. Well, nice little trivia items. Let's see. So uh, I didn't get in the water. You didn't get in the water. Has anybody gotten in the water? Are we at that in-between part of the season where it's not quite river dive season, but uh, there's no ice to get up on? Did I lose you, Mac? I think I did. We'll hold off for Mac to reconnect oh, here. Sorry about that. 
I, oh, you muted? Here I am talking, and then I realized when you said that, oh, you can't hear me. <coughs> no, I can't. Yeah. I was going to say the, uh, the only diving local club members had been by uh, Marie Davy, Daisy and family. Oh, that's right. And that recovery yeah, aspect, and that was done. Water temperature is 37, and a dry seat was highly encouraged and appreciated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We also have one diver who is now, or may have been finished, but he's down in Florida doing some diving in the Keys, so we know he's having fun. And somebody else that. had just, oh yeah, and Bob and them had just got back. So at the dive meeting, he was talking about diving with the Mantis last week. Yeah, yeah he, they, they've been doing that the last few years now, yeah. going down and diving with the Mantis. Yep. If you can, do it. And he can't oh, yeah. till he did. Yeah, certainly. Get out there and enjoy it while you can. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so do we have uh, we heard anybody got any plans? Uh, I don't think anybody's been on the big lake yet, other than maybe the piers. Yeah, not that I know of. Uh, they're talking since it's now spring. There's no reason not to get out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are talking about uh, the uh, Michigan Underwater Divers did, in fact, donate uh, $1,000 to the Southwestern Michigan Underwater Preserve at our dive meeting. Uh, that means we hope to be the first area, meaning the Havana in our back back, back of the woods here. Uh, yeah. They're going to buoy that one hopefully in the next month or two. So this yeah. summer we will have a approved, Coast Guard approved, lighted, lit buoy on the Havana as the first of hopefully at least six in our six observe. Yeah. Yeah, and for those who don't realize, out out in uh, the Great Lakes here, uh, at least off of Michigan, any buoys you, you were seeing, most of them weren't Coast Guard approved on wrecks. They were buoys that uh, markers that just happened to get out there somehow. Uh, and they could be anything from uh, uh, bleach, old uh, recycled bleach bottles or uh, cooking oil containers, you know, usually something out of some sort of plastic that was uh, tied off to a wreck, you know, not properly secured onto an independent mooring. Uh, so you, you never really knew unless you talked to somebody local to wreck how you were going to get to it. And the other alternative was to drop an anchor, snag the wreck, and hope you didn't damage it too much. So uh, part of the preserve effort is to put these properly approved moorings on and then a buoy up in the surface so people know how to attach to the wreck and where the wreck actually is. Right. They will be attached off the wreck with a line from the downline to the wreck. So you do not have to drag through and damage the wrecks anymore. Yeah. It'll go to a submerged buoy at 15 feet. And that'll be your stop. <coughs> then to the top, you'll have your mooring buoy, which will have a mooring line off of it. The one that we're going to be having to use here is also required to have a strobe light on it. So, um, you're going to be able to find it pretty easy, whether they have GPS or not. Yeah. In in the Southwest Michigan Underwater Preserve, uh, because all our wrecks are fairly close to shore and in the the navigation lanes, they all are going to have to be lit. Yeah, right. Because you have a lot of um, summer traffic from port to port. Mm-hmm. And most people don't like to go five miles out and then come back in five. So they yeah. go a mile or two off. And boogie from South Haven to Benton Harbor, Benton Harbor down to New Buffalo, yeah. New Buffalo to Michigan City. So yeah. you're not going to go far off. And traveling at night and you're not paying attention during the daytime, you're really going to appreciate having something go blink, blink in front of you. I wonder what people are going to think of these buoys. It'll be interesting well, they're going to be on the navigation that. charts. That's one of the advantages. And they are protected because they are now official government-type buoys. So if anybody cuts this one, because we've had really good buoys before, and they've disappeared, if these get disappearing uh, and can be traced down to who did that, they're going to be in a world of hurt. Mm-hmm. I wonder what it would take. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't. I won't say it in the podcast, but maybe we'll we'll talk about it in the preserve meeting. Uh, I got some ideas on some ways maybe to mark or track some of these buoys that may make some sense. But that is good news. I'm glad that the uh, 
the dive club was able to to approve that. I wasn't able to make the meeting, but seems like an appropriate use of funds considering that of, of people dive in the wreck. Uh, I mean, Havana is a popular one even outside the dive club. But well, that's that I, was the idea. It one, it's it's local. It's it's uh, something everybody does. It's a very good first time wreck because it's not hazardous. It's at a reasonable depth that you don't go into deco. Uh, visibility, of course, can be up or down, but that's a like any wreck. And we really believe it's going to be the stepping stone and the springboard for being able to get funding to get all the other ones done. Because if you dove wrecks up in the straits, you know how much you appreciate the big ones like the Cedarville. It has three buoys on it. Mm-hmm. You appreciate like crazy being able to go right up to it, tie off. You're not wasting any time. You're not creating traffic for, you know, because that's a shipping lane. Yep. Uh, it, it makes a difference. And well, uh, I think that's going to help out in our preserve, be able to get additional fundings to get all the major ones done. You know, well, how many times have we gotten out there? You, you turn your uh, GPS on for the first time of the year, and then you're like, crap, you know, my numbers aren't here. And then you well, got to call somebody up and try and track down numbers and. And even if you do, the issue is, if there's no buoy, you got to drag an anchor. You're damaging yeah. whatever's left of that wreck. Yeah, and you, if you yeah. look at the North Shore, people say, well, why? The, the ice doesn't go down. Why is the superstructure damaged? It's damaged because people are dragging an anchor, trying to get a hook on it to dive it. You know, you're mm-hmm. talking 100 and some odd feet down. Yeah. You've got a lot of scope out there and a lot of drag. This is yeah, going to make right. a big difference in maintaining the uh, diveability of a lot of these wrecks. Yes. Well, do you have a safety article for the week? No, I do not have one tonight. I had it okay. and it went go poof. <laughs> That's it's somewhere funny. out there, but Lord knows I can't find it. Darn okay. it. But not a- when it's that time, I do have a diver joke. Oh, well, let me see. Do we have anything we want to plug before we get there? I mean, the, uh, you know, we'll have the, you know, we're doing the, the the Michigan Underwater Divers Dive Club, which is mugclub dot uh, dot com, if you want to visit that website. Uh, you now they're they're donating to the first one, and you'll be seeing some press releases on that. So hopefully we get that one can get out marked here in the next month or so, and then uh, we'll be looking for funding for the remainder of the uh, the buoy. So uh, you know the Southwest Michigan Underwater Preserve is a 503C nonprofit recognized by the state of Michigan and the federal government. And we are hoping to uh, put buoys on all the diveable wrecks, but we've got four that are shortlisted and I believe they're all approved. So after this first one, hopefully we can just go right down the list and get them all. Yeah, I'll be glad I'm going to get the iron side because that's a very popular one. And in fact, uh, SAS has a, a charter. I think they're trying to fill up some charters for that one now. Mm-hmm. And having yeah. that buoyed makes a big difference in your time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we have uh, Rockaway was on the list, Havana. Yep. Ann Arbor uh, 5. Ann Arbor 5. Yep. Even though that may be a little bit out of the border since it's, uh, it's deeper. Yeah. yeah, we won't tell It's still a that. highly popular wreck. Oh, and yeah, uh, they're looking to see if we have anything even near. Uh, park shoreline areas mm-hmm. because they have a preference and some type of funding if those are booked. So we're trying yeah. to find what's near some parks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, the, the, the wreck itself for Ann Arbor 5 is deeper than recreational, but there are parts of that wreck you can get on in recreational depth. Yeah, the, the important part, the screws, the props, rudder, oh, yeah. the t- the aft section. That's a great photo op. Yeah. And, and you can do that at it's for a dip 120. Yeah. So once they get that buoyed, that takes a lot of the challenge off of that wreck because until it got buoyed, it's 160 feet to the bottom. So you may have to run an anchor. And then if the visibility isn't that great, you got to go to the bottom, find the wreck, and then come back up. So. You know, that adds a lot of bottom time for not a lot of benefit. So if you can moor to a buoy, right, a buoy on the wreck, 
or near, you know, with a line attached to the wreck, that is the the best way to do it. And Absolutely. Beautiful shots. If you want a Facebook profile photo, that's the wreck, provided that you're trained to go to 125 feet. That's the one that you want to go and get your photo in front of. Yep. Other than that, we've got a presentation coming up. Uh, we're going to be working at the Sportsman uh, Dinner. Mm-hmm. That's going to be uh, April 13th. That's a Saturday. <coughs> That'll be a, we'll probably set up at 4.30 and have that. We're going to do the display like we did at Niles mm-hmm. uh, with a projector showing the type of objects that we recover as opposed to taking lots and lots of little bottles. We're going to have some good shots of uh, bicycles and guns and swords and all that kind of stuff that people always love to look at. Mm-hmm. Well, that'd be and great. The second item is, if you don't have it on your calendar, you need to add it. I believe it's the 27th of April. We're going to have a um, introduction to scuba Ooh. at the St. Joe High School again. Uh, it's going to be a little different this year because – you know, we went and participated as hanger honors, and we can still do it. There's going to be a $5 ahead charge to come in and use your gear. So it's still a good time to come yeah. in, check out your dry suit, try out your regulators before you get out in the big lake. And the money, though, is going to be donated to the Southwestern Michigan Underwater Preserve going towards the buoy fund. Oh, excellent. So that's a win win. Yeah. And in yeah, the so afternoon, be- if you're so inclined, and if you're going to be part of the buoy team, you have to have certain certifications current, and uh, this is an opportunity to pick them up for AED training, O2, uh, basic first aid, uh, and there's something else I'm forgetting. There's four four classes that's going to be held after uh, the uh, is it an oxygen Cuba. provider. Is that the other one? Yeah, oxygen provider. That's the other one. Yeah, and that's open to. You know, and I think there's a there's a slight cost for that, but it's extremely mm-hmm. reasonable. Yes. Yep. So, so those, welcome, those are all good ones to have. Oh, absolutely, especially since the club has all of that equipment. And uh, I like you to be trained. If you're on my boat and I have a problem, yes, I want to I want to make sure everybody knows how to instead of taking the jumper cables and hook it to the battery, I prefer you use the AED. Yeah, yeah. You you want them to know which end to put different things in. Absolutely. And what not to do. Yes. So that's what we got scheduled for April so far. And I would not be a bit surprised if we're on shipwrecks during the month of April. Oh, certainly. Well, I think it's that time of the show. I, I understand that maybe for this 400th, you may have a joke this time. Well, this is a little longer than normal, but we're going to have to struggle through it. Are you okay. ready? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm- uh, a diver boarded an airplane and took a seat. As he settled in, he glanced up and saw the most beautiful woman boarding the plane. He soon realized she was heading straight towards his seats. As fate would have it, she took the seat right behind his. Eager to strike up a conversation, he blurred out, Business trip or pleasure? She turned, smiled, and said, Business. I'm going to the annual Nymphomaniac of American Convention in Boston. He swallowed hard. Here is the most gorgeous woman he'd ever seen sitting next to him, and she was going to a meeting of the nymphomaniacs. Struggling to maintain his composure, he calmly asked, uh, What's your business at the convention? I'm a lecturer, she said. I use information I have learned from my personal experiences to be debunk some of the most popular myths about sexuality. Whoops, excuse me. Really, he said, what kind of myths are they? Well, she explained, One popular myth is that African-American men are the most well-endowed men, when in fact it's the Native American Indian who is likely to possess that trait. Another popular myth is that the Frenchmen are the best lovers. Actually, it's men of Mexican descent who are the best. I have also discovered that the lover with the absolutely the best anima is a southern redneck. Suddenly, the woman became a little uncomfortable and blushed. I'm sorry. I shouldn't really be discussing all of this with you at all. I'm, I don't even know your name. The man said, Tonto. My name is Tonto Gonzalez, and, but my, all, all my friends call me Bubba. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, just imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are the odds? 
Uh, yep, I am. I mean, what are the odds? Santo Gonzalez called me about. Jeez. <laughs> All I know is he sure wrote the thought fast. Yeah, good thinking. But too bad I can't show you the picture. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can you, but I can't the other people. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, go out there and get wet. And stay safe. Craig, leave us alone, or did he cover us? Uh, he was—he made it the—he made it the whole way. Good, but here, here we, here we're going to have him leave.